Now, therefore, let us see how it is that they dare to ascribe the very great extent and duration of the Roman Empire to those gods whom they contend that they worship honorably, even by the obsequies of vile games and the ministry of vile men. Although I should like first to inquire for a little what reason, what prudence there is in wishing to glory in the greatness and extent of the empire, when you cannot point out the happiness of men who are always rolling with dark fear and cruel lust in warlike slaughter waters and in blood, which, whether shed in civil or foreign war, is still human blood. So that their joy may be compared to glass in its fragile splendor, of which one is horribly afraid lest it should be suddenly broken in pieces, that this may be more easily discerned, let us not come to naught by being carried away with empty boasting, or blunt the edge of our attention by loud sounding names of things, when we hear of peoples, kingdoms, provinces. But let us suppose a case of two men, for each individual man, like one letter in a language, is as it were the element of a city or kingdom, however far spreading in its occupation of the earth. Of these two men, let us suppose that one is poor, or rather of middling circumstances, the other very rich. But the rich man is anxious with fears, pining with discontent, burning with covetousness, never secure, always uneasy, panting from the perpetual strife of his enemies, adding to his patrimony indeed by these miseries to an immense degree, and by these additions always heaping up most bitter cares. But that other man of moderate wealth is contented with a small and compact estate, most dear to his own family, enjoying the sweetest peace with his kindred neighbors and friends. In piety religious, benignant in mind, healthy in body, in life frugal, in manners chaste, in conscience secure. I know not whether anyone can be such a fool that he dare hesitate which to prefer. As, therefore, in the case of these two men, so in two families, in two nations, in two kingdoms, this test of tranquility holds good, and if we apply it vigilantly and without prejudice, we shall quite easily see where the mere show of happiness dwells, and where real felicity. Wherefore, if the true God is worshipped, and if he is served with genuine rights and true virtue, it is advantageous that good men should long reign both far and wide. Nor is this advantageous so much to themselves as to those over whom they reign. For, so far as concerns themselves, their piety and probity, which are great gifts of God, suffice to give them true felicity, enabling them to live well the life that now is, and afterwards to receive that which is eternal. In this world, therefore, the dominion of good men is profitable, not so much for themselves as for human affairs, but the dominion of bad men is hurtful chiefly to themselves who rule, for they destroy their own souls by a greater license and wickedness, while those who are put under them in service are not hurt except by their own iniquity. For to the just, all the evils imposed on them by unjust rulers are not the punishment of crime, but the test of virtue. Therefore, the good man, although he is a slave, is free, but the bad man, even if he reigns, is a slave. And that not of one man, but what is far more grievous, is of many masters as he has vices, of which vices, when the divine scripture treats, it says, for of whom any man is overcome, to the same he is also the bond slave.